And this is um, motivated by uh, uh, two recent papers. One is a paper uh, by a uh, uh, postdoc of mine and, a, and a, a research scientist of mine that were looking at um, uh, low frequency, very low frequency, the Cato variability and the Kirishio extension, and then how that affects uh, subseasonal and seasonal forecasts um, made over um, uh, North America. And so I'll, I'll show you some nice examples of that where eddies in the Kirishio extension affect the downstream rainfall. And that just depends on not, not the individual eddy evolution, but whether there's a lot of eddy activity versus no eddy activity. So I'll describe that. And then the second piece of motivation is this recent paper by one of my students who was really looking at um, destructive and constructive interference associated with the MJO and ENSO on subseasonal uh, timescales. And when I started, you know, started writing this talk, I was really focusing in on uh, could the, you know, these two mo these, uh, this model at two different resolutions capture this uh, superposition or uh, constructive and destructive interference. And so that was sort of my original goal. But as I dug in deeper, I was starting to wonder about whether I'm looking at um, how Gulf Stream variability is affecting southeastern U.S. rainfall. So I'll, I'll try to explain these sort of combined conflicting ideas. And I'm going to start with sort of the conclusions. Uh, so the bottom line, or upshot, whatever you want to call it, the bottom line is Kirishio eddies have a downstream effect on U.S. rainfall. That's from subseasonal to uh, decadal timescale. And of course, you know, you can look at uh, cases where and there's no El Nino at all, and you can you can uh, diagnose the Kirishio eddy effect, and uh, there's definitely constructive and destructive interference with ENSO, and this effect is uh, is captured in these uh, subseasonal and seasonal forecasts with this eddy resolving model that we'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, however, when we get to the decadal timescales, the model's not capturing that entire procession on those longer timescales at either. Uh, eddy resolving or eddy uh, parameterized versions. The, the other thing I want to talk about and show you some results that Gulf Stream variability has this sort of upstream effect on rainfall in the southeast U.S. That's also on these subseasonal to decadal timescales. Uh, and the uh, model that actually resolves the Gulf Stream uh, over predicts this effect in, in part. And I'll show you a nice example of that. However, the, you know, the standard resolution of the model, the model that's Sort of used for the sub X project and, and NMME uh, with a poorly resolved Gulf Stream totally over predicts the influence of ENSO. I'll try to show that. And then the bulk of the talk, I'm going to be mostly talking about this sort of this original goal, looking at this MJO ENSO interference and how that in, in, impacts the subseasonal timescales. Uh, and there's definitely some improvements when we use this higher resolution model, but when I dig into specific events, really looking at, at that. Uh, superposition, and I'm going to show you, I'll show you an, an example or two of that. Uh, whether I'm looking at the MJO constructive and destructive interference, or whether I'm looking at the Gulf Stream, remains a, an interesting question, which I think we can get at by looking at these runs. But but I haven't done that yet. So uh, just to explain the the experiments that we're doing here, um, it's CCSM4. We run it at uh, two rev two different resolutions. It's a Half degree, the high resolution one is a half degree atmosphere and a tenth of degree ocean. The low resolution one is a one degree atmosphere coupled to a one degree ocean. Sort of the standard NMME configuration is the low resolution one or sub X configuration. The initialization is very crude, it's brute force. I just take CFSR off the shelf, or in fact, we've tested it with other initializations, and we just uh, simply interpolate that into the model. We've gotten a lot of feedback. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, since 2009, I think we started doing this, we, or even earlier. We've gotten a lot of feedback, you know, uh, from the ocean community that we, you know, that they were worried that this this wouldn't work. And we, I think, we pretty much demonstrated that this sort of brute force initialization does works fairly well, at least on subseasonal and seasonal timescales. It, it, you know, on decadal timescales, it's still an open question, something that we're working on testing. Then when we transitioned to doing this from the one degree to, to a tenth of a degree, we really got a lot of pushback. And again, I do, I do think it's working. We're not uh, arguing that we're predicting the individual eddies correctly or initializing the individual eddies correctly. What we're trying to do is uh, 
uh, capture these sort of mesoscale ocean features better. So we, we get eddy amplitudes better. We get boundary curves better. We're not actually predicting the individual eddies. Uh, so I'm going to be showing you three member ensembles. They're uh, burst, you know, so they're all valid starting January 1st. And we run cases from 1982 through uh, 2015. So this is the, the uh, Kirishio uh, uh, result, just, just uh, synopsis of that Kirishio result in a, in a nutshell. And, and uh, so I have several panels here. And let me go through them because it's, it's a lot to go through here. So uh, on the upper upper side here, this is looking at those uh, Kirishio uh, active and inactive years. So it's when the eddy activity is large. Not not worried about the individual eddies again. And these are non ENSO years. And this is this is taken from uh, trim data. And and the positives. I apologize for the color scheme here. The positives here in red are showing enhanced uh, rainfall in those active eddy years in the, um, in the uh, Western US or Western North America. And then this is now a result taking those high resolution forecasts initialized, and just looking at JFM, again, just those non-ENSO years and those eddy uh, active years. And you can see this uh, pretty clear signal of enhanced rainfall uh, looking you know, reasonably similar to what's happening in the trend data. And then the bottom panel is that one by one model. It does get some enhancement of rainfall in Southern California, but uh, or the la lower lower part of California, but not quite uh, the signal that you're seeing in um, in the high resolution model or in the trim data. Uh, this is digging in that into that a little more in a little more detail. This is the CMORF uh, BLD estimate. Um, this is looking at those uh, active eddy years minus the inactive eddy years. So you can see uh, the enhanced rainfall is in the, the deep uh, uh, purples here uh, from the observations. And then this is the high resolution model, even capturing a little bit of that structural detail uh, in the uh, central part of the US. And then the bottom panel is the low resolution model, same exact years in the verification, same, same exact year. So it's not a skill score, but it is sort of a verification, if you will. And then this is looking at the probability, uh, the daily uh, rainfall probabilities, uh, the, um, uh, 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 the blue curve here is the probability, the cumulative probabilities for the active eddy years, and the orange curve is for the inactive eddy years. And you can see both the observations and the model get this uh, you know, distinct difference between the active and inactive uh, eddy periods, and that is sort of missing from from the uh, uh, one by one uh, model. And you can this is again looking at active minus inactive. This is uh, just looking at in this box uh, where all that eddy activity is. This is looking at the the shading is the vertical velocity, and you can see even with a half degree atmosphere, those those eddies are uh, the atmosphere is actually responding to those eddies. With, with changes in vertical velocity, whereas the low resolution model just sees a sort of totally different kind of uh, profile. Okay, uh, moving over to why I think the Gulf Stream is, uh, is something that we should be talking about. This is again, looking at um, uh, uh, the high resolution model and the low resolution model compared to observational estimates. And the, the contouring is uh, the sea surface temperatures and I'm sorry, the shading is sea surface temperatures and the contours are uh, 200 millibar uh, geopotential height anomalies. And there's a couple of points I wanna make here. One, you see, uh, of course, in the observations, you see uh, ridging in association with those warm SSTs uh, in the observations and the model. It, 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 you know, by no stretch of the imagination is there a perfect, you know, it's not a perfect forecast. You can see that wave train is considerably different downstream uh, in the high resolution model compared to the low resolution model, but the collocation of uh, the observations, but the collocation of the of the ridging uh, in the in the model in the high resolution model in the observations between the SST is 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 readily apparent. Uh, the other thing you notice is that uh, you don't really see much of a signal in the tropical Pacific. Uh, maybe a little bit in observations and considerably less in the high resolution model. So it's not it's not an ENSO force pattern. It's really uh, it's it's really uh, related to the Gulf Stream. 
And then this is trying to do the same analysis with the low resolution model, and we don't get anything like that. I mean, you get you get this uh, distorted, you know, big ridge, but it's more uh, generally connected to what's going on in the tropical Pacific. It's more of a mixing of the wave trains from the Pacific and maybe a little bit of, of changes in the Gulf Stream. It's not as, as clearly defined by, by the Gulf Stream. And uh, I should point out that it's, it's this part right in here, this, uh, this part of the circulation in here that we really think is, is uh, affecting uh, the rainfall differences in the Southeast US. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. So this is looking at, looking at that again in a little more, a little more uh, detail. Uh, this is a slightly longer time scale. This is uh, looking at uh, the top panel here is the GPCP uh, rainfall variance. And you can see a big in the oval here, a big signal in the Southeastern US. Uh, low resolution model. These are from simulations, not forecast this time. Uh, the simulated low resolution model, uh, not 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 much variance, or at least considerably lower in this estimate, considerably lower than uh, than observations, and then uh, a little bit better in the uh, high resolution model. Now this next set of panels is similar to the previous set, but instead I'm making an index out of the rainfall over the southeast U.S. So I make a long-term index of the rainfall over the southeast U.S. And I uh, regress that onto uh, SSTs and uh, uh, 200 millibar height. And so the top row, apologize for all these figures, but the top row is the regression of that rainfall index uh, onto SSTs. And so you can see there's a little bit of a signal, you know, uh, weak, but a little bit of signal and a fairly big uh, Pacific signal in the low resolution model, almost, almost no end. So in the high resolution model, and a whopper of the signal uh, in the Atlantic, and then something in between in the observational estimates. That's um, my argument that maybe it's being over 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 predicting. And then this is uh, the 200 millibar heights that go along with that um, uh, with that that pattern. And so you can see you know sort of an anemic signal connected to this sort of classic uh, high heights everywhere in the tropics associated with ENSO and and then quite a bit different in signal in the high resolution model, again, perhaps overdoing it. And then um, observations looking more like the high resolution model, but again, that sense that it's over predicting that. Okay, so let's get to the MJO part um, of the talk here. So uh, what my student did is uh, very, just a very careful analysis, uh, trying to filter uh, a time series of rainfall over the US, on daily time scales, uh, filter it for uh, El Nino and, and filter it for the MJO and look at the various uh, phases of the MJO. And this first, this panel here on the, on this side is just showing you what that filter looks like. And it's a simple, we tried out a bunch of different filters, but it's, a, it's really a very simple filter. And uh, 120 day mean we use to um, uh, isolate El Nino. And we, when we remove that time, we remove the 120 day mean uh, from the time series, we're calling that um, subseasonal variability, if you will. There have been other similar indices. A previous uh, uh, paper by um, Hendon and colleagues used a 120, 120 day, uh, the previous 120 days mean to remove, uh, and that they were thinking in the forecast mode. That's why they did that. But if you look at the red curve carefully, you can see there's hints of. Um, uh, the El Nino signal in that in that filter, so we decided that was problematic. Uh, so to identify uh, subseasonal variability or the MJO variability, is we use the the uh, Wheeler and Hendon index, um, and uh, these composites that I'm going to be showing you are just based on one one standard deviation composites, and then one standard deviation composites for our for uh, ENSO also. And so the top row here is looking at the MJO signal in a composite of all MJO days, phases two and three, uh, phases four and five, six and seven, and eight and one. And then this is um, using those same days during phase two and three, what does the El Nino look like? Four and five, six and seven. So it's not a perfect ENSO composite, it's a composite of El Nino during uh, MJO days, but filtering the data. And then the the last column here is the superposition, and the point is you can you can see that during the, depending on the phase of the MJO, you can see a very different 
signal when you combine you combine both. Okay, uh, that's, this is now for La Nina, uh, perhaps less dramatic in the La Nina composite. Uh, same format, phases two and th three through uh, eight and one, and you can see those superpositions can make a quite a bit of quite a big a difference when you when you consider both versus just just the La Nina composite. The uh, uh, the picture over here, uh, this is really looking at the ratio of active and inactive MJO days, and the real point I want to make is the big signal of increased uh, rainfall variance is is in the Southeast US. And that's where we're gonna be primar primarily looking at. And, and this is standing up to some pretty, uh, pretty conservative statistical tests. Okay, uh, just to go along with that, I'm, I'm uh, very much concerned about looking at the heights. I apologize for this being a little bit blurry. Um, hopefully when we drill down a little bit, it'll, it'll, it'll come out better. Uh, this is uh, uh, 500 millibar heights. These are observational, I'm uh, sorry, 200 millibar heights. These are observational estimates, the same, exactly the same format from below. The MJO part, the ENSO part here, the combined, and then La Nina over here. Um, and so you can see there's the, the MJO itself during phases four and five is different uh, for those, uh, those, those La Nina years than it is for uh, the El Nino years. So even you know, this superposition depends on on what that El Nino and La Nina look like also. Uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll dig into more of that a little bit. Uh, this is uh, now actually, this is based on those forecasts. So those um, 1982 to 2015 forecasts, this is the week three, four uh, observed here, uh, GPCP. So this is a slightly uh, short, uh, well, in 1997, I think, uh, starts a shorter time series. But this is the uh, model that I observed climatology. This is the climatology from the low resolution model. And here's the climatology over the same period for the high resolution model. And you can see there is an enhanced, certainly enhanced rainfall in the Southeast US in the higher resolution model. Uh, looking at the variability now, this is just the week three, four. These are in the forecast. This is looking at the variability uh, in the observational estimates here. Uh, the, again, the low resolution model and the high resolution model. So again, you see enhanced amplitude in the Southeast US. And what I'm arguing is that enhanced amplitude is coming from, um, uh, is either, it could be, uh, could be better resolved MJO, I don't really know, or it could be uh, enhanced Gulf Stream variability. My suspicion is it's actually the Gulf Stream and not, not, the, not the MJO, but we were really going down that MJO path as part of this talk. This is then looking at uh, same kind of format. I, I didn't, uh, apologies for not including the observations. I just neglected to have time for that. But this is looking at the week three, four SST variability, and you can see considerably more uh, variability um, uh, standard deviation in the, in the Gulf Stream uh, compared to uh, the observations, I mean, compared to the low resolution model. Uh, this is not a uh, skill score talk. I'm not really talking about one model being more skillful in the, in the, uh, classical sense of looking at skill uh, skill scores and you know correlation coefficients but I did did think I should show one correlation coefficient this is the week three four of these January one initialization uh, forecasts uh, I don't really make too much of this but there's definitely a hint that the model is uh, performing somewhat better than than the um, lower resolution model in the southeast US in the central part of the country it's performing uh, worse, maybe uh, I don't know, and and there might be some improvements in the West Coast, uh, but um, I, I I don't want to make too much of this correlation coefficient because you know uh, we're just looking at one set of forecasts initialized on January 1st, so I think more more forecasts would need to be done to make too broad a statement about the correlation. Okay, so what I really wanted to start doing is okay, let's. Let's assume the you know the high resolution model has a little bit better skill. We, we want to think about where that's coming from. Um, uh, let's start looking at individual cases. And so uh, one of the cases that really jumped off the page in Mary Beth's pa paper is this 1997-98 uh, um, warm event. Uh, and uh, she breaks down that warm event looking at different phases of the just like before. This is for just 1997-98. It's not the overall composite. So it's looking at 
what is what's the El Nino signal during that warm event, and uh, what's the MGO and what's the composite uh, combined during that warm event covering this uh, period and more. Okay. Uh, just this is a low resolution model just to show you in a broad brush sense, uh, you know, no surprise, January 2nd to January 26th, this is when phases six and seven dominated in 98, there's no surprise that um, uh, uh, the model forecast at SST looks very ENSO-like, it's a very reasonable forecast, it's, it's uh, you know, these short, very short lead times for SST anyways, uh, the model at low resolution in, in, in the broad sense looks really quite good. Let's start drilling down a little bit and the first drill down here is just to look at the whole uh, northern hemisphere sector here. And you can see the top panel is the observational estimates. The bottom panel is the high resolution and the low resolution is in the middle. In the Pacific, they, you know, other than a little bit of noisiness, they really have uh, quite a bit of agreement all the way through the coast. Uh, you know, even some, uh, you know, details are, 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 you know, subtle details are nearly matching up in the high and the low resolution model. Really pretty good. Uh, the Atlantic sector might actually be a little bit different. So if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, you know, there's hints of some uh, warming, you know, warm patterns in there developing in the observations. It's not really captured all that well from the low resolution model. And there's hints of it perhaps getting that right in the high resolution model. And then just, you know, over a significant portion of the eastern seaboard, uh, it does look like the, you know, sort of warm patterns are better captured than in the, in the high resolution model than the low resolution model. And so this is drilling down into the into the uh, Atlantic in a little more detail so we can just see that a little bit better. Again, fairly similar in the Pacific, but in the uh, Atlantic um, hints, you know, I, I can't say, you know, uh, with certainty that the high resolution model is a better SFP forecast in the Atlantic, but at least some of the structural details are, are captured a little bit better. Okay, so let's, let's com actually compare these forecasts uh, a little more carefully. So uh, the uh, top row here, this is from that, those, um, for that 1998 uh, January case, this is the, the filtered for using the Wheeler and Hendon index for subseasonal time scale. This is the rainfall from the observational estimates. This is using exactly the same dates, uh, filtering the data for uh, low frequencies this is the ENSO signal, uh, and then this is the, you know, just summing, summing these two up and getting this panel. The, uh, bottom, the bottom is looking at the ensemble of uh, uh, forecasts uh, here for the low-resolution model and for the high-resolution model. And you can see, uh, you know, if you look at a global map, you might not notice this, but when you look at the rainfall over the U.S., you can see a um, you know, the, in the low resolution model, the rainfall has shifted o almost entirely over the ocean. You don't have a very strong signal in the southeast U.S., whereas the model, uh, the high resolution model seems to be capturing a southeast U.S. signal uh, a little bit, a little bit better. The west uh, is kind of a mixed bag. I don't know if I would necessarily say one is necessarily performing better than the other. And if we look at the same, same, same sort of format, if we look at the the um, 500 millibar heights in the same kind of format. Um, this uh, middle row is the uh, you know NJO, um, uh, the ENSO, and then the El Nino signal. And if we same format, if we dig into the forecast, uh, what we're seeing here is this uh, low resolution model here. Uh, I think it more favorably compares to the ENSO signal. So this uh, notion of you know things seem to be more. Uh, and so driven in that low resolution model or less sensitive to to uh, uh, Gulf Stream variability, whereas in the in the uh, high resolution model we have this nice strong uh, ridge anomaly here, uh, and you see that in the observations and uh, connected to uh, you know arguably you could say oh well maybe it's the MJO. I this is where I'm stuck. I don't know if I'm not stuck. We're still working on it. I should say. We don't know if this is uh, MJO or um, uh, um, uh, Gulf Stream variability. And then on this horribly blurry figure, this is just underscoring that, you know, that low resolution model. This is the com overall composite, overall El Nino cases, really looking much more El Nino-ish uh, in this particular, uh, this particular pattern. 
from the low resolution model. Uh, just a little bit more detail. This is uh, this is the meridiana velocity 850 millibars. Uh, so this is uh, southward flow out of the southeast U.S. This is northward flow uh, in, uh, into the southeast U.S. And then these are the 850 millibar heights. And so this you know this northward flow is consistent. You know you can imagine this uh, circulation like this happening in the high resolution model, and you have um, uh, anticyclonic circulation happening. Um, in the uh, low resolution model. And that, that sense of northward versus southward is important. Um, uh, you know, if you just think, if you just think about geostrophic vorticity in the low levels, you know, maybe we can uh, linearize geostrophic vorticity equation, uh, uh, steady geostrophic vorticity equation. If we ignore the advection of relative vorticity and just think of the balance between um, planetary advection of planetary vorticity, meridional advection of planetary vorticity, has to balance the divergence. And so we would expect there to be uh, enhanced uh, divergence in this region, and that's why we're getting enhanced rainfall. Whereas in the, in the uh, low resolution model, the northward flow is out here over the ocean, more strongly out here over the ocean, and that's where it's producing its, uh, its rainfall. And then this is a moisture transport, just consistent with that. I can see I'm running out of time. Um, so I'm, uh, we've done more events and looked at a, a lot of different uh, cases. I just just want to get back to the conclusions. Uh, so we, you know, we feel we feel like we have pretty solid results that the secure shio eddies are having this downstream effect on U.S. rainfall, and the high resolution model is able to capture that in a uh, pretty robust way. Um, the Gulf Stream uh, de definitely has a, an effect on rainfall in the southeast U.S. We're seeing that quite robustly. Uh, we are. Uh, you know, looking at is it is it over predicting this effect? Is it too strong of an effect? But that you know, conversely, the the uh, poorly resolved Gulf Stream over predicts the influence of ENSO. And then the last you know big part of this talk, I talked about this MJO ENSO interference. And you know, I'm it shows certainly the eddy resolving model is showing some improvement in the southeast rainfall prediction. But I'm still uh, still looking at this question: Are are we actually looking at MJO? We're going to apply this. Same filtering technique and start to dig into that a little bit. Can we can we relate it? You know, the when uh, Mary Beth did that work, she was really thinking about the tropical imprint of the MJO uh, forcing a mid-latitude teleconnection. And if that propagates into the region, is that affecting the ENSO signal? So that's really what Mary Beth was thinking. And I don't know if that's coming through actual MJO or is it coming through the Gulf Stream? And is it the MJO influencing the Gulf Stream? You know, that that all needs to be sorted out. And uh, I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the discussion document. I just want to remind the attendees uh, that you can click through to that discussion document to add your questions. Uh, the first one we have, um, in the plot of 200 hectopascal anomaly for the Gulf Stream part of the plot, where Ben said this is a mix of wave trains from the Pacific and maybe a little bit of the Gulf Stream, was that for a particular season or the year? What was the time of that figure? Uh, that's the winter season. Okay. Winter season. Thank you. Um, uh, next question, when you plot ENSO plus MJO, is that depicting temporarily coincident effects? Yes, they're always temporary. Those composites are all tempor temporally uh, consistent. So it's not, the grand, it's not a grand MJO composite. It's an MJO, we filter the data to remove the subseasonal variability and then we plot the same days as the MJO composite. So they're exactly the same days are going into those composites. Hope that Great. clarifies. Yes, thank you. Um, and the next question, what are the physics mechanisms that the Kuroshio eddies have downstream effects on the Western U.S. precipitation? Uh, well, they're pumping a lot of moisture when the, those eddies are really active and grinding away. They're pumping a lot of moisture into the boundary layer, and that gets uh, 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 gets sucked up into the free troposphere. And then when it comes 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 over land uh, over the western U.S., it gets wrung out as rainfall. That's the mechanism we're seeing. Great, thank you. So I'm not seeing any other 
typing in the discussion document at the moment, um, just to give a couple more minutes for people to add questions if they have them. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that this is a recurring webinar series and um, we do have webinars on the first Monday of the month, every month. Uh, I encourage you to, to visit our website, which is linked, um, if you want more information or if you're interested in giving a webinar. Um, I see we may have um, some other folks asking questions, so I'm just going to hold for a few more seconds here. Um, hi, uh, Ben, I, I just ask directly because I have access. Um, in terms of those uh, uh, crucial edits and Gulf Stream edits, uh, the impacts on the U.S. precip, do you think the the initializations of those edits uh, are important, or is the is the interaction in, in the forecasting time to keeping those edits activities? What which uh, yeah, no, great question. I, I don't, I don't think the the individual eddies, the individual evolution of the eddies is important. I think it's the energetics. So um, uh, it's the rectification of the eddies onto the atmosphere. At least that's true in the Kuroshio. In the Gulf, uh, the Gulf Stream, uh, getting the the Gulf Stream front in the right place is probably important. Uh, so uh, you, you know, the SST anomalies associated with undulations in the where the Gulf Stream is sitting is, is it is important, but I don't see that as a direct eddy effect. And I think the ocean data simulation system we're using to drive initial conditions captures the position of the Gulf Stream reasonably well. Do does it get the eddies in the right place in the Kuroshio? I don't think so, uh, but at least it has that en some energy from that in in the Kuroshio, and then uh, the model spins that up right away. It keeps that energy right away. We we can look at even in week one. There is a big difference in the SST energy in the in the uh, eddy resolving model compared to the uh, eddy parameterized model. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you. So, um, not seeing other questions for either of our presenters, uh, I'd like to thank Mike and Ben very much for two interesting talks today, and thank you to all of our attendees for some good questions and discussion. And I hope to see everyone next month for our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.